Roland, you also mentioned another therapeutic avenue is addictions. And that's, I, I'm very interested in hearing about that because we've had uh, a number of podcast episodes on programs uh, for people who are suffering from addiction. So I am very interested in to hear about some of the therapeutic opportunities for that as well. Well, that's, um, this again comes out of the research done in the 1960s that, that looked primarily at the use of these classic hallucinogens and treatment of alcoholism and a few studies in, in drug abuse. The results of that literature were equivocal. The studies weren't designed uh, entirely satisfactorily and certainly not to today's standards. Um, but um, the, the, the thought here is that could um, a, a mystical experience of the type that we've already discussed uh, alter someone's relationships and, and addictions? And so one Interesting thing is if you look at the history of addictions, very often uh, people will report spontaneous uh, abstinence uh, based on a, 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 a spontaneously occurring mystical type experience or epiphany, if you will. And probably the most famous example of that is Bill Wilson, founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, who had a, an, an experience of uh, enlightenment, he, he might describe it as, uh, when he was undergoing DTs from an alcohol withdrawal. And on the basis of that, he founded the whole Alcoholics Anonymous movement. And if you look at the 12 steps, about half, I think it's six of the 12 steps, are involved surrendering to higher power or acknowledging, uh, acknowledging one's lack of control and needing to surrender to something larger than oneself which is the core piece of the mystical experience. So the thought is that uh, people who have these kinds of experiences might be able to engage in AA or other kinds of therapeutic modalities more effectively. And in this regard, we have initiated a, a pilot study uh, uh, here at Johns Hopkins in cigarette smokers. We've treated four smokers to date. Uh, all remain abstinent. Two are now past a year, one past six months, one has only been a couple weeks out. Uh, uh, but um, there's, uh, there, there may be something here. We're looking at psilocybin in combination with cognitive behavioral therapy. And, and, uh, and the understanding here is that psilocybin may enhance self-efficacy at, at, uh, at a very core level. And we'll see. We, we certainly need to uh, collect more more data, but the approach appears promising. There are other uh, academic centers in the country that are initiating studies of uh, psilocybin and alcoholism. So stay tuned. I will, and it's interesting to hear about that, and in particular the way you were uh, describing the the 12-step program uh, we had in episode 56, we interviewed Kevin Griffin, who is the uh, author of a couple of books. The one in particular we were talking about at that time was A Burning Desire, Dharma, God, and the Path of Recovery. And in particular, we were talking about that higher power piece of it, because there's a, a reflexive tendency within atheists and, and often skeptic groups to to automatically put that into the traditional 12-step program is a Judeo-Christian framework of the Judeo-Christian God. Not necessarily so, that there are other ways to look at this in which it's uh, simply a, these are things you can't control. That is very much a valid approach to treatment in uh, one's therapeutic approach to an addiction recovery. So it's interesting to hear that there are some uh, potentials for what you're studying in that as well that that you know may have impact to how we approach the higher power. Yeah, and I and let me just uh, uh, underscore the point you're making there. So this mystical experience uh, isn't necessarily an experience of an encounter with higher power per right. se, but there's right. a right. there's a there's an unknown and, also, and and indeed for some people it is 
um, depending on their mindset. But for, for other people, there's this sense of this interconnectedness of all things, uh, the, the, the under, undergirding fabric of life and reality that is awesome and, uh, and, <laughs> and, and we lack, uh, we lack words that can describe this very adequately, but you certainly don't have to have any kind of theistic belief to have that experience and be moved by that experience. Exactly, and nor do we as as non-believers need to reject the experience, because really that's what we're talking about is the that there is an experience. It is happening to a person. The conclusions we draw are, are a separate matter that people take into their own hands. They draw their different conclusions, and, and that's... That's fine. Sometimes that's a very positive thing. Sometimes it's it's not so much. But the fact remains that there is an experience, and that can be personally transformative because the experience itself changes the way we look at things, and that's where the transformation comes in. Yes, and and let, let me say one of the most interesting implications of our work with psilocybin that that we can occasion these experiences with very high probability. In our last study, over 70% of people had a full mystical experience. The implication of that, to me, is that these experiences are biologically normal. That is, we as human organisms are wired to have these kinds of experiences. It's part of our biology. And so it makes sense that they've occurred spontaneously under certain conditions and maybe their genetic predispositions or other kinds of factor. But this isn't, this isn't, uh, uh, this, this is, uh, completely, appears to be completely part of how we're put together. Mm-hmm. Yep. And, and, and then you can get into the philosophical question about, well, why? And, <laughs> and that, and, and, you know, there are material and non-material uh, you know, approaches to the answer to that. Uh, but, uh, but that's, that's philosophy as far as I'm concerned. The, the fact is that the experience occurs. It's biologically normal and it's reorganizational of the human condition, uh, when it occurs. And uh, what I would argue is that it's foundational to the ethical and moral codes that have been developed, you know, by our, our species cross-culturally. You, if you look at the core ethical, moral traditions and what they say about um, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, this interconnectedness of all of all people uh, and things, uh, you know, that's it. So we're, we're talking about something fundamentally important. We don't have to get caught up on the philosophical or, you know, theological implications of it. It's a yeah. natural science. Yeah, having a, a naturalistic explanation for what's happening does not in any way, shape, or form take away from the importance and meaningfulness and positive impacts these experiences can have. Absolutely. Absolutely, and I'm actually looking at that website right now, and there are very good resources about that, including information about how the study works, who should volunteer, uh, what is uh, psilocybin, and the facilities, uh, all of it. It's it's a really um, terrific opportunity for those who are struggling, because this is, of course, not happy news. This is very hard, and it's not just hard on the person who has cancer. It's hard on everyone in their lives, and there are probably very few listeners here who have not in some way been touched by cancer, by someone they may know, a loved one, they themselves. So I do urge you to go out to that site. Let me read that again. Uh, The location is www.cancer-insight.org. And we've been speaking with Dr. Roland Griffiths, Professor of the Department of Psychology and Neuroscience at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Roland, thank you so much for being here. I'm very, very glad to have spent this time with you today. It's been a great pleasure for me, Ted. Thank you, and thank you for your great work with uh, the Secular Buddhist.
Thanks for listening. If you'd like to learn more about something you've heard in today's podcast, please come visit the companion website at www.thesecularbuddhist.com, and you'll find an entire web page devoted to this and every episode. There are also links to discussions about today's topic on the Secular Buddhist Facebook fan page. The music for The Secular Buddhist is used by permission from John Kaizen Neptune's CD, Steps in Time. Additional music is provided courtesy of Monty Levinson of Taihei Shakuhachi and Rodrigo Rodriguez. Their websites are linked on The Secular Buddhist on the About Music page. Until next time, remember, every moment you have a choice. Make it the best you can. See you next time on The Secular Buddhist.